Welcome to the Platyhelminthes video. We will be talking about flatworms, and Platyhelminthes actually means flatworm. It comes from the Greek roots platy, which is flat, and helminth worm. These things are very small, tend to be in the order of a millimeter or two, maybe half a centimeter, and occasionally larger. Uh, not very thick, but as we look at this body shape of Platyhelminthes, we'll be able to compare it to the Cnidarians that we looked at before, and we could see how, with a few modifications to that same body plan, these are the next step along the evolutionary pathway to more complexity. They're usually uh, not very brightly colored, but sometimes they could be quite beautiful. And so let's have a little slideshow of what we might expect to see with some of these marine flatworms. And you'll see from the surrounding material that these are very small organisms. Here we have a small encrusting sponges and some other stuff that you're going to see on, on a reef, encrusting organisms. And you can see the size of the grains with these beautiful colors. And they're folded, but you can see that the body shape is flat, not very thick. Okay, here's another one. Beautiful colors. And, but also very, very flat, and these things tend to sort of ghost along at night, or if you turn over rocks, sometimes you'll find these things, and, but occasionally you'll see something quite beautiful. All right, generally, this is the shape of what we're looking at with a flatworm. You'll see the two eye spots, no segments, okay, so they're just one big bag of flesh, no circulatory system. Okay, so all of the movement of wastes happens by diffusion. So the oxygen diffuses in from the outside, and the carbon dioxide and other respiratory products and products of metabolism just diffuse out through the skin into the surrounding water. That is why these organisms need to be very thin, okay, because as something gets thicker, the diffusion rate is too slow, so that's why we uh, have a circulatory system, because otherwise the carbon dioxide and the other waste products from our cells wouldn't be able to diffuse all the way out to the outside environment. And you can see this video on YouTube about diffusion if you don't understand the concept. Okay, they have an incomplete gut, which means that they don't have a mouth and a separate anus. They have one opening to their gut, just like we saw with a cnidarian, with a jellyfish, or an anemone, or corals. And they have cephalization, which means they have a nervous system with cerebral uh, ganglion. So the nervous system is a little more than the neural net. But the cephalization, cephalus means head, and so that means that they have a brain well, essentially a uh, collection of nervous cells, of neural cells, that is essentially what a brain is. A brain is a collection of nervous cells, but they have a, a collection of nervous cells which is much less sophisticated than our brain, but it is organized to one side of the body rather than the neural net that we saw with a jellyfish. And so we also have a lot of the sensory features of that organism grouped to that one side of the body as well. So we've got the eye spots, we've got sensory lobes up here that do things like smell and sensitive to touch. And so we've got that all grouped at one end and we call that a head. So like we have our eyes, ears, nose, and a lot of, and taste all grouped into one area, which is our head and the brain then these things also have the same thing. And we didn't see that in the Cnidarians. Okay, and if you've got this uh, cephalization, then that implies a directionality to movement. So these things are going to move in one direction. And you're able, with the cephalus, with the cephalization, to sense what's coming up in front of you. And they tend to be hermaphrodites. So let's have a little bit better look at these things. All right, so the mouth is in the center of the stomach. If we look at this as the, uh, the lower side or the ventral side, the dorsal side being the top, like a dorsal fin in a shark or a dolphin. Okay, this is the ventral side. And so you have a mouth in the middle 
and the food goes in through that mouth. They've got these this pharynx, but it's a muscular passageway that helps with swallowing and moving food down into the stomach uh, or the gut. We won't call it a stomach, we'll call it a gut. That's represented by this blue area and it's got lots of little folds and bags and invagination in order to increase surface area so you get better digestive capacity with a, more, with a lot more surface area. You get a, the ability to absorb more material because you've got more surface area to do it. Then we have a nerve running down, a nerve cord running down both sides, okay? And instead of the neural net like we saw in the cnidarians, we have this brain, this ganglion, this collection of nervous cells, nervous tissue that organizes the movement and directs that organization to all the musculature down the body, down the length of the body. And we also have these two light-sensitive patches on the surface, which we would not call eyes. Uh, they're called eye spots, but they aren't eyes like we have with, uh, with a lens and, and lots and lots of parts there they are essentially just a light sensitive patch of ectoderm or epiderm a skin area that's sensitive to the light and so when they have light re photoreceptors that send messages to the brain so now we're seeing the beginnings of vision all right let's have another look so here's another uh, probably a little easier way to see the mouth if you see this this thing. So they sort of come up and they eat with their mouth at the center of their stomach. They just uh, use this muscular pharynx to uh, suck up food and pass it into this long, long gut that goes the length of their body. Branch down at the bottom. All right, so these things are carnivores, predators or scavengers. They tend to be scavengers or parasites. They don't tend to eat a lot of live food. Most of the time they'll eat dead food or their parasites. And some of them act, uh, parasitize oysters and other bivalves. So if one of, the, uh, one of the ways that oysters deal with these things is to start to cover them over with the mother of pearl, that uh, interior of the shell. So if they cover them over, then sometimes these parasites become natural pearls. These are one of the irritating things that they can try to um, combat by turning into pearls. So they breed either by sexual reproduction through copulation, so the first time we've seen that, rather than broadcasting eggs, or 
uh, they can e asexually reproduce through transverse fission or fragmentation. So by what transverse fission means is splitting right down the middle of the body and then turning into two organisms. So here we see it with a with a single cell thing, which is not an animal. Or in here, we can see that this um, flatworm, you see it's two little eye, googly eye spots right here, and then its sensory lobes is splitting right down the middle, and this will turn into two flatworms. This tends to be more your, your the color that you're going to see in a flatworm, those brightly colored ones that we do see occasionally, but they tend to be more either browny or white colored. Okay, so let's review. That's pretty much it. The platy helminthes, okay? Etymology from the Greek platy for flat and helminthes for worms, and flatworms. The characteristics of the platy helminthes, they're bilaterally symmetrical. Okay, we saw radial symmetry in the cnidarians and asymmetry in sponges. Like we are, these plat flatworms are just like us. If you split us down the middle, it's a mirror image from one side of the body to the other. And that's called bilateral symmetry. They have three layers of tissues with organs. So instead of being diploblastic, like we saw in cnidarians, with only two layers. So in the cnidarians, we saw an epiderm or ectoderm. Again, ecto being outside or epi being on top of. And then derm, here's that root word derm again, which means layer. So we have the epiderm or ectoderm, and then we had the endoderm or gastroderm that we saw before in the cnidarians. But these ones also, instead of having a mesoglia or mesohyle, they have tissue, they have living material or in between the two layers, the interior and exterior layer. And this allows for the development of larger muscles and other organs, which means that an organism can get bigger and more complex, develop circulatory systems and the like. And this is called triploblasty. So tri, instead of diploblasty, di being, meaning two, we have tri. So th essentially three layers. We've got a epiderm or ectoderm, an endoderm, and now we have mesoderm, so middle layer, middle, so meso-middle, like as in mesoglia or mesohyle. Okay. Uh, Two-way gut, a mouth and anus are the same opening, so they have to take their food in and then digest it and then spit it out the same opening. Okay, very simple. Not good for the breath, but very simple has a nervous system of longitudinal fibers rather than the net, so that's all centrally organized in, this, in the cephalus and the head region. They're den generally dorsoventrally flattened, so that means from the top to the bottom. Dorso meaning top, ventral from the bottom. Okay. Uh, reproduction mostly sexual as hermaphrodites, meaning they have both male and female abilities. And mostly they parasitize other animals or scavenge. Few feet on algae. And occur in all major habitats, including many as parasites. So just about anywhere you go, you're going to find flatworms. And if you want to see a, the world's worst rap, then go to this URL and watch this uh, video, and you'll see the, uh, some girls doing the world's worst rap about uh, flatworms. That's it.